Halito Chimachukma, this is Chief Steve coming at y'all with another one, another episode of True Story. Before we get into it, if you're new to the channel, be sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell on your notification. Hit that button so you know when I get these uh, bombs out, I'll be the first one to catch them. All right, y'all, we're getting into this book right here. It's once again on archive.org. That is my go-to. You can see the credentials right there up top on the toolbar. Archive.org. That's my source. And the video is entitled, Egyptians are the children of the Mayans. This book that we're getting into is called The Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches. Well, 11,500 years ago, their relation to the sacred mysteries of Egypt, Greece, Chaldea, and India, Freemasonry, and time interior to the Temple of Solomon. All right. This was uh, written by Augustus Le Pengeon, Le Plangeon. He was born 1826, died in 1908. Publication date is 1909. All right. So I've been getting into this book a little bit on my free time and ran into some really interesting things that I'd like to share with y'all. And we're going to be starting on page 112. Once again, I gave you the title of the book, gave you the source of credentials. If you would like to get this book, it is for free. You can download it for free on Internet Archive at archive.org. But um, it's been a lot of talk about Egypt and the relations to the Aboriginal Americans. And although this, this right here doesn't go into saying that Egypt is here. We know that the original Egypt was indeed here in the Americas. And this is further proof showing that they were. Um, I got a train coming. So let me uh, pause for the cause and let this train go by real quick. Alrighty, y'all, we're back. The worst is basically over. At least I thought. Somebody's throwing something in the trash can. Look, y'all, I live in the hood. I live on the other side of the tracks, as you can hear. Train coming by. <laughs> but uh, either way, we're going to get into it. This is page 112 of the Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches. All right, we're going to be starting over here on the second paragraph, which is right here. Ooh. Oh, let's go back right there, starting on this side here. All right, y'all. Man, these loud ass trains, yo. Okay. We have already said how the Maya sages have taken care to perpetuate their cosmogonical conceptions by causing the narrative of the creation to be carved in high relief over the doorway of the east facade, facade of the palace at Chichen Itza, and that these conceptions were identical with those of the Hindus and the Egyptians. It cannot be argued that this identity of ideas about the origin of things arrived at by the wise men of India, Egypt, and Mayox, it's back in the day it was called Mayox, and expressed in as nearly the same words as the genius of the vernacular of these various countries admits is purely accidental, or that they have arrived separately at the same conclusion on the subject without communicating with one another or one with the other. The notion and its explanation must have originated with one and been taught to the others 
just as our modern scientific discoveries or religious beliefs are carried from country to country, even the most remote and made known to their inhabitants. What should we think of the man who would pretend that the railway, the electric telegraph, and many other of the latest inventions, instead of having originated in one particular country, nay, more, in the brain of a particular man, have sprung simultaneously among all the various nations which make use of them? Would not that man be regarded as a born idiot or a fit subject for a lunatic asylum? We can easily understand how these cosmogonical notions have passed from the Egyptians to the Chaldees or to the Hindus or vice versa. But who brought them to the lands of the West and when? Who can say they did not arise among the inhabitants? of the Western continent and were not conveyed by them to the other nations. See, he's about to get into it, but so far he's explaining that basically all these different cultures, these different places from all over the world share a similar culture. And it would be stupid in his 1800s ways of saying it, it would be stupid for somebody to think that, oh, all these different cultures just simultaneously, you know, thought of the same concepts to, to do their thing just out of nowhere, out of thin air. We're just that darn like hurt effect. No, nah, it doesn't work like that. Just like how you have modern inventions today being made in the U.S., being patented in the U.S., and then later on given to Europe to different parts of the world and just, you know, being built upon from that in as many different ways and styles is the same way that culture and ancient civilization was doing its thing. It had to originate somewhere. And what this man is saying that who is to say that it did not originate from the lands of the West? And he goes on to further prove why he's saying that. Here we go. He says, in my work, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. And for those who know who Queen Mu is, y'all know who it is. Y'all regard, regard her as, as the original Isis, the one who came from the Americas and established Egypt where it was, brought that culture to that plane, you know what I'm saying? And those of you who don't know who Queen Mu is, do your research, I highly suggest that you, you check her out. In my work, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx, by the way, I gave you the, the real quick, I gave y'all the author of this book so y'all can check his, his stuff out. He should have this out on archive. I haven't looked for it yet, but, um. Archive is an open metadata, has all the library books and everything from all over the, the world. So a majority of them, a good amount of them. So try your luck, you know, and search this out. Gives you the title right here, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. I have shown how the legends accompanying the images of several of the Egyptian deities when interpreted by means of the Maya language Point directly to Mayox as the birthplace of the Egyptian civilization. You hear that? The birthplace of the Egyptian civilization. How the ancient Maya heretic alphabet discovered by me, which is the author, is as near alike to the ancient heretic alphabet of the Egyptians as two alphabets can possibly be forcing upon us the conclusion that the Mayas and the Egyptians either learned the art of writing from the same masters or that the Egyptians learned it from the Mayas. He didn't say that the Mayas learned it from the Egyptians. The Egyptians learned it from the Mayas. And you can tell, as everybody has proven and shown 
in different videos of different different folks who are coming into this truth and are awakening our people. They have shown and proved that the pyramids, even something as basic as the pyramids out here, are thousands of years older than the, the Egyptian pyramids that they know out there than Giza. They're older than Giza. We got thousands of pyramids that are thousands of years older than the pyramids out there in what you know as Egypt today. Okay? And this brother's going on to say, well, I don't know if it was a brother or not, but he sure is speaking like one when he says the Egyptians learned it from the Mayas. All right? There is every reason to believe that the cosmogonical conception so widely spread originated with the Mayas and were communicated by them to all the other nations among which we find their name. You hear me? So Everywhere you go, you're going to find that name. It's going to relate to Maya some kind of way throughout, these, throughout all these ancient civilizations. An analysis of the tablet of creation carved on the facade of the palace of Chichen Itza cannot fail, therefore, to prove interesting. Cannot fail to prove interesting. Why? In it, we shall find a proof of the scientific attainments of its designers and also the reason why the serpent came to be worshipped all over the world. Okay? The philosophers of Mayox must have known that the waters cover the greatest part of the globe, about three-fifths, and that water, being a combination of gases, oxygen and hydrogen, the most subtile of fluids, must have been the first form of matter produced, which means we knew this. We knew we knew about science. We knew about water. We knew about how the earth worked. According to this, 11,500 years ago from the 1800s and even before then, you feel me? This is why on each side and on the top of the tablet, they place the symbol of water. And that is what the symbol of water looks like taking care to leave without it at the upper part, a portion equal to two-fifths of its length. So they knew the above and below spectrum, how it worked. In the midst of the waters, they, represent, they represented the figure of an egg that is a germ. Why an egg and not any other seed? Is it because their study of physiology had made them acquainted with the fact that no beings exist on earth, but that is born from an egg? And even you can talk about the, the, the uterus of the, of the woman, you know, the eggs of a woman. The woman has eggs inside of her that you have to fertilize as a man. You have to put that seed in that egg, and that egg turns into a fetus, and that fetus is born into a baby. You feel me? Gave y'all a quick lesson on the birds and the bees, I guess. <laughs> well, there you go. You know, share this with your kids. Nah. <laughs> but uh, the rays, it says they represented, uh, let me see where I'm at here. Okay, no beings exist, but that is born from an egg. And it says, they represented the egg emitting rays. The rays of the light into which says Thoth. And y'all should know who Thoth is. Thoth is also known as Tahuti. And y'all should, you know, if y'all need to get into that or need me to get more into, you know, the Egyptology and things of that nature. I mean, I'm not really into that too much. I used to be, though. I mean, back in my prior studies, when I was coming into truth back in the day, you know, it's kind of like a gateway. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, shout out to the whole tips. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, we all we all have been there at one point, you know, for the most part. So, you know, I know a little bit about a little bit. But if you need me to go in a little deeper, be sure to, you know, comment and let me know, you know, hey, let's get a little more acquainted with this now. 
I'll adjust my content to y'all suggestions. We'll see what's going on with that. But um, thought says all things resolve themselves. That says the Kiche, author of the Papava, Kiche are people, the author of the Papava, appeared on the water as an increasing brightness that bathed the creator. So this is what they all saying. This is all what these different cultures are saying. Saying is that they, they, it appeared, the egg appeared on the water as an increasing brightness that bathed the creator. Okay, the feathered serpent, which is the feathered serpent. The nef, the nef is also an Egyptian term for the creator. The nef, as the Egyptians would name it, in green and azure. So, once again, an egg coming out of the water, emitting rays, the rays of light, to which says Thoth, all things resolve themselves. And it says that the Kiche, the author of the Papava, appeared on the water as an increasing brightness that bathed the creator, the feathered serpent, the Neph, as the Egyptians would name it, in green and azure. Okay? It is well to notice that the symbols of water terminate with the head of serpents because they compared the waves of the ocean to the undulations of, it's supposed to be an image right here, but it ain't showing too much. Oh, there it goes right there. This is a bit of the image. I don't know if you guys can really make this out. Like I said, be sure to get this book. And if you can get a phys if you can find a physical copy, more power to you. I don't know how much it will cost, but it has images in here that you can um, basically get into. And so these are some of the images right here. But the undulations of the serpent's body while in motion. The waves represented the serpent's body while in motion. Okay. For this reason, the Mayas named the sea Kana the great, the powerful serpent. And in the Traano manuscripts, and if you don't know about those, look those up, the Traano manuscripts. That's also another, another plethora of truth in that. The sea is always designated by a serpent's head. This explains why the Kiches, the Mayas, the Egyptians, the Hindus represented the world and by extension, the maker of it as a serpent okay thus it is that they place a serpent within the egg behind the creator to indicate that this symbol is the totem the totem of the ancestor of all beings all right and you know totems are uh, what you would call a, a spirit animal you know the attributes of of a a, a personified deity you know what I mean? So, hey, that's that's what it was. The it was a it was a re, it was a representation of what they know as the creator, what the Mayas know as the creator, what the Hindus and the Egyptians and the Kiches know as the creator. And he's saying that this whole concept came from our ancestors, the Mayas, our Southern Indians, our Southern American Indians. And here we have one of the origins of the serpent worship, that is the adoration of the creator. Okay. In Egypt, the goddess Uati, the genius of the lower country, is at times represented as a serpent with inflated breast. The body standing erect over a basket or saive or sieve. The lower part resting against a figure resembling our numeral eight. Like, it looks like the number eight. I'm going to go down so you guys can get a better view of it. It says, at times again, as a winged serpent with inflated breasts, wearing on its head a cap or a crown of peculiar shape. See? And that's, that's what it is. Now, look, if you notice right here on this serpent, that eight... That eight part right there is turned on its side. And we know today the sideways eight 
is a representation of what? Infinity. The eight sideways is the number infinity, which means it's everlasting. It's never ending. All right. So the creator was infinite. You feel me? Whatever they 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 personified as a creator. The representation of the creator is infinite. Y'all about to see what they mean by the serpent, though. What is the true representation of? And as you can see right here, keep in mind this crown on top. We're going to get more into it. The winged serpent with the inflated breast. And where's that crown on top of his head? That crown is very significant. We're going to get more into that as we go down. As we go through. Keep that keep that crown in mind. All right? All right. It is said to be the crown of lower Egypt. Why the Egyptians selected such symbols to represent the lower country, we are not informed. And it is doubt... Doubtful if the learned Egyptologists could explain the motive. So even back then, the Egyptologists only knew so much. They couldn't even explain why they were wearing what they were wearing, why they were rocking what they were rocking. They were just out there digging up graves for the most part and, you know, hieroglyphs and different things like that. And they was putting their own theories to mind. And that's what you have to keep in mind here. You know, all of these are theories until proven true. And in this book, he proves his theories to be true. And that's why he's giving us these facts here. So check this out. It says, now it is a most remarkable fact that these are the very symbols used by the Maya hierogrammatists, which are the, 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 the writers, the hierogrammatists, and the artists, the drawers, to figure their own motherland. The Maya Empire. So he's saying that the snake is the symbol. These are the symbols. The snake is the symbol of the Maya Empire. Okay? Egypt is rocking or 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 throwing out hieroglyphs representing their creator, which is a resemblance of the Maya Empire. Hmm. Makes you think, don't it? The author of the Triano Manuscripts sometimes pictures Mayox. And you know, Mayox is the original name of the Mayan uh, uh, area, empire. Mayox as a serpent with an inflated breast. At other times, as a serpent with part of the body bent in the shape of the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay? So, this the, they're writing the creator in the likeness of the land. They're saying that the land is the creator. They're giving homage to where they came from. These different ancient civilizations are giving homage to where they originally came from. And the artist who, ex who executed, and real quick, this is what they said is bent in the shape of the peninsula right here. This is, this is one of the images right, right here. That's where we at. See that? And real quick, it has a footnote. Basically everything I just told you. An interpretation of the Maya legend explanatory of the illustration may not be amiss. Inasmuch as it shows that the serpent was the symbol of the country. Serpent is the representation of the creator. And the creator, the serpent also represents the symbol of the country. They're giving homage to the motherland. This is the motherland. the Yucatan Peninsula, and the artist who executed the paintings in the funeral chamber of Prince Cole typified 
the country as a winged serpent with the back painted green, the belly yellow, wearing a blue crown on the head, its tail ending with a peculiar dart resembling in general contour the southern continent of America. Okay? This is not the place to give minute explanations of these symbols, which I have considered in another work. So he even goes deeper into it in another work. He doesn't give the title here, but if you look up the artist or the, the author uh, that I gave you earlier, you should be able to find plenty of books um, from him. And you can check those out. And plus he has different volumes of these as well. So, you know, do your research, do your due diligence. Okay, I've considered in another work and says, I simply wish to consign here such facts as cannot be attributed altogether to hazard, which means all of this that you see that's similar, that's happening amongst these different cultures from all over the world, how they're all interconnected to one another and resemble one another is not an accident. This is not by accident. So the peculiar twist against which rests the body of the serpent emblem of the lower country is exactly the same that forms the symbol, which is that symbol you see in front of you, used in the Triano manuscripts to represent the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. Hmm. Whose waters bathe. And then it goes into this right here. You can pause and get into that if you want to. And the fuller thing for you. But let me let me go back real quick so I can pick up where I'm at. Who bathe. who bathed the peninsula of Yucatan that seems as if standing erect between them as the serpent in the Egyptian sign, in the Egyptian sign. As to the Sieve or the Saive, it is called by the natives of that country, Mayab. What? Mayab. Mayab was, in past ages, one of the names of the peninsula, the crown of Lower Egypt, which is that right there, Oop. which is that right there, is precisely that worn by the chief, by the certain chieftains, whose portraits we see in the bas reliefs at Chichen Itza. Okay. There, the peak was worn in front, in Egypt, at the back. There, the peak was worn in the front. So this this peak part here, this this part right here, this part where you see Egypt, the word Egypt, this whole left side right here, was worn in the front part. This was worn in the front part, and then the one on the the back the back side where it's going slanted is worn on the front part. The back part was run on the front part by the Egyptians. And I got a, a, a good picture. And it should be included in the thumbnail. If you didn't see a thumbnail uh, or pay too much attention to the thumbnail, I'm about to show you guys once again uh, a rendition of how the Egyptians wore it. And a side-by-side -side comparison to the Maya, which, you know, today as a Yucatan peninsula so let's pause for the cause right here and um we're gonna pick back up on that side-by-side -side illustration alrighty y'all we're back and as you can see this right here is how the egyptians wore that crown as you see with the serpent peak the serpent on his head representing the creator and that is all resembling the Yucatan Peninsula the Maya and as you can see right here got the Gulf of Mexico Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean 
C, bathing. And you see right there, bathing the creator, bathing the serpent. You see that? And it does look like the head of a serpent a little bit. I can't zoom in anymore, but look at the top of that. It does look like the head of a serpent. All right. And you can see the resemblance right there side by side. This is Egypt on the left. This is a resemblance or, or an illustration of Egypt on the left. And this is the Yucatan Peninsula or Maya right here on the right. Do you see that? Can you see the resemblance? Because <laughs> I know I can. See, I mean, I need to stop messing with this. But I, I can see it. You know. And if you're just one of them ones that just refuse to see what's in front of you, then, hey, it is what it is. But I'm telling you, this is what it is. All right. So we're going to pause for the cause. Once again, we're going to finish off in this book here. All right, y'all. So I just showed y'all side by side illustration. Egypt to my uh, the crown what it looked like and also keeping it keeping that image in mind you see how the egyptian wore that crown basically the 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 deities or the kings the chieftains of maya would wear it the other way it would it would be shaped the other way so the long part would be towards the front of the head and the the lower part would be in the back of the head so there, and it says right here, there, right here, where we're at. There the peak was worn in front in Egypt at the back. Maybe as a mark of respect on the part of the Egyptians toward their mother country. To signify, for real, got racers over here. <laughs> anyway. Uh, made me lose my train of thought, man. Shoot. Hope he raced into a gas station to pay some money. There the peak was worn in front in Egypt at the back, maybe as a mark of respect on the part of the Egyptians toward their mother country to signify that as the child. Egypt must stand behind its parent. Huh? as it is customary for children to do among the aborigines of Yucatan. All right, so that's Egyptian, that's, that's Egypt. Recognizing who they are, where they got their culture from, what they really about. They recognizing who the OGs really are by wearing, by the way that the, they head heads, by their head chieftains, they pharaohs, wear they crown. They crown even represents that, hey, although I may be the head altogether, I'm still and we, we still we standing behind our mother. We standing behind our parent. We the child. They the parent. They representing the Americas. They representing the Americas. All right. Since the Egyptians and the Mayas used identical signs as symbols of the country in which they lived, may it not be inferred that the same cause prompted their selection? We must not lose sight of the fact that the winged serpents introduced into the paintings of Egypt are merely emblematic representations connected with the mystery, mystery or mysterious? I don't know. Here's another image for y'all as well and like i said it's all the egyptians wore it it's all the egyptians wore it in the back this brother right here bro right here with the hoop earrings is wearing it towards the front he's wearing that peak towards the front that's how you know he the og he's the head he's the front so if this brother was to go out to egypt with this crown on, they wouldn't know exactly who he is. They know that he is chief of the OGs. And that one that I showed you, and as I was wearing it towards the back, will have to bow down and respect 
the one that is the head. This is an American Indian. This brother right here is a Maya. An American Indian. You feel me? An indigenous copper colored aborigine. May I mind you, if you did not know, now you know. So the mysterious, it represents the mysterious rites of the dead and the mode of being in a mentee. Okay? So when they do that, it's, it's being in the mode of a mentee. And the mode of a mentee means, it says that is, in the lands of the West, where the souls of the departed were supposed to return and exist after being liberated from their mortal body. Woo! So this is saying that when they die, hallelujah, by and by, they going back to the Americas. They going back. That's that's the land. That's their motherland. That's where their essence was created. That's why they represent as the creator. Because they know who their mother is. Egypt knows who its mother is. Okay? Gonna make me start preaching up in here. Shoot. Let's let's keep going. We almost done, y'all. And if you're still rocking with me, make sure that y'all like this video, share, share this video, and man, please subscribe. Cause man, I really, I really appreciate the support. I appreciate you guys for rocking with me this far. And to my 11 subscribers, as of me making this video, Tata Kista, I appreciate you guys. I cherish y'all so much. You know. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm still putting this truth out there. I'm going to keep doing it. Ain't nothing going to stop me. But people need to know. Especially these Pan-Africans. They need to know. Because all these Pan-Africans, they're not banging West Africa. They're not banging East Africa. They're not banging South Africa. they banging Egypt. Every time you say, why do you think they call them the Hoteppers? What, where, where does Hotep come from? That comes from Egypt. That comes from what they call Kemet. That's Egypt. They need to bow down and realize who their mama is. These Pan-Africans don't even know what's going on. They need to realize who their mama is. Now, I done showed y'all. They just said Egypt is the child of the Mayans. Come on now. Why would they feel that their afterlife, in their afterlife, these Egyptians, in their afterlife, go to Maya, go to Amenti, being in Amenti, the lands of the West? Why would they feel that? That's because they know where their DNA comes from. They know who they are. They know who they be. The child of the American Aborigine. The children of the Aboriginal Americans. In early days, Iwati and, Ma and Mati were Matai, Uatai, that were Matai. The country of Mayaks was one of the divinities worshipped by the settlers on the banks of the Nile and the Asp. Not any other snake, not any other snake, played a conspicuous part in their religious mysteries and was universally honored. Universally honored. From the Hindus to the Chaldees to the Kiches to the Egyptians, they all worship that Mayan serpent. And that's where I'm going to stop at right now. If you guys want to read on more, I su highly suggest you guys get the book. I showed you my sources from the beginning. I never hide my sources from y'all. If y'all need more feedback, let me know. My, your feedback is truly appreciated. Be sure to comment. Like I said, like this video. Help me get into the algorithm because these Pan-Africans need to know. 
These whole tappers need to know where they come from. It's not me telling them. I can't tell you nothing. I can only show you what I see. Show you what's being presented to me by the ancestors. All right? That's all I'm doing. I'm just forwarding the information. That's it and that's all. It's up to you to either accept it or to do more digging for yourself and 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 bring the facts and the truth. All right. So on that note, I'm going to get out of here. This is Chief Steve signing off. Tatakista. I cherish y'all. Yakoki. Thank you.